Okay, so today um, we're trying to emphasize the emphasis of the importance of chemistry. So just to take you a little bit down the chemistry ro road as to what's the chemistry of these colors and how do they change when we put them into food products. Okay, and the first one we're going to look at is chlorophyll. And Tara's just going to set up a little experiment for you there. Normally the sources of chlorophyll, as you can see uh, there on the, the screen, are green leafy vegetables, so things like spinach and, and cabbage, um, broccoli. And what we've brought today is uh, some spinach leaves, fresh spinach leaves. And do you, do you want to explain what you're, you're doing there, Tara? Okay, so one is going, going into to acid. Now it's very mild acid, like you would find um, in a lot of uh, food environments. Okay, and that's the way that, that, that'll go. So you'll have seen an example of this um, if you've ever cooked green vegetables at home. When the vegetables are fresh, they're bright green and then if you cook things like green beans or, or broccoli then you will get a dull brown color and um, what we're doing here is demonstrating the dull brown color that you'll get and how to protect it so as to keep the the color bright green okay so this is what you'll get when you cook this one and you'll see in a few moments as this boils this is what you get when you cook that one okay so the difference in the two uh, solutions is that you have copper present. Okay, I'm not going to go through the chemistry of it, but just to show you what's happening, in the center of that structure, you can see a magnesium ion, and it's holding four ring structures together, four pyrrole rings. And what happens when you heat your broccoli or heat your spinach is that magnesium pops out during the heating. And what we're doing here is replacing the magnesium with copper and by doing that you keep the nice bright color okay so maintaining the colors can be very much uh, dependent on the the chemistry okay so this this overcooked brownie color that you get and in the case of spinach here and other green veg green vegetables that can be avoided by simply having the presence of copper so most of the colors that you'll see in confectionery products will actually have some copper present to make them much more stable so you can get nice bright green colors um, based on chlorophyll by having the the copper present so this is the type of color you'll find in mint ice cream in green vegetables in order to protect them or any of the green sweets that are here will tend to be chlorophyll based so again it's by understanding the chemistry you can make some of the the products um look good so you'll see the changes they heat up there but they're ones as i say on the chefing programs that we did earlier so that that you can uh, see them okay so that that's one example how you you can change the color of products the other uh, pigments i was going to show you are anthocyanins now these are the pigments that are present in berries, strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, and they give the lovely colors to things like cranberry juice, raspberry juice. So things like Ribena will be very high in these type of uh, pigments. But the difficulty with the, these pigments is that they can change color quite a lot. So you may start off with this um, bright red color, and if you heat it for any reason, you may end up with that and often you don't want to happen that that to happen with food products and for most food products we do need to heat them to make them safe so the fruit juices that you buy in cartons they've been heated and pasteurized to make sure they're safe to eat so you really don't want those colors to be changing that much they may look pretty but you don't want something to be red one day and purple uh, the next day okay so these nice uh, blue colors the difficulty with them, and we're going to show that using the example of uh, red cabbage here, 
Okay, so red cabbage is an example of something that's high in anthocyanins. Okay, you can see the, the bright uh, purpley red color. Okay, and what Tara's doing there is she's going to add one to acid. So she's just adding vinegar to it or acetic acid. And to the other one, she's adding um, bicarbonate to make it basic. So on the opposite end of a pH scale. And what happens, you'll see as they heat there, we can leave those on heating for a little while. That the one in acid goes this color and the one in the base goes this purple color. So very large differences in the color by small effects on the, on the chemistry. So again, that can have a large effect um, on food products. What's happening from a chemistry point of view is the basic pigment here, you can see has a positive charge in it. And as you change the pH, this gets, gets affected. It's quite a complicated chemistry path we won't go into, but as a result of the changes occurring to the charge on the pigment, you get very different colors resulting. Okay, so sometimes you can use it to your advantage, but a lot of times you don't want that to happen. Okay, the other thing in terms of protecting the um, color in fruits and vegetables is we tend within the food industry to try and freeze them as quickly as possible. So it's just to show you here today some of the techniques uh, that are used. We're just going to fast freeze uh, strawberries. You'll see that they'll be frozen in a matter of seconds and that you keep the, the nice red color. Don't know if you've ever noticed that if you eat frozen peas, they have a nice bright green color. Whereas that if you've ever had marifat or dried peas, they're quite dull. You're keeping the green in the peas because of the fact that you're uh, freezing it uh, so quickly. Okay, so we, within the industry, it's pretty much a similar approach that you're going from, I don't know if you want to see how frozen this is in a matter of seconds. And basically the appearance of the strawberry has hardly, has hardly changed. Okay, sorry for those at the back, we're not going to be able to get them all the way, the way up to you, but it's just demonstrating that you've got the color retained, you've the structure retained, and it's all within a, a matter of minutes that, that you're, you're doing it. Okay, so Tara will keep going there, and we can pass a few more around for you, for you to see um, as we're going. Okay, then just to mention something about um, artificial food colors. Have you heard of E numbers? Yeah. What, can someone tell me something about E numbers? Yeah? Okay, anything else about E numbers? Do you think of good things or bad things when, when you hear of an E number? Bad things. Bad things. And what kind of bad things? <laughs> Behavioral changes, yeah, is what they're associated with, okay? So part of doing the chemistry today is, is to talk about the chemistry of the colors. The other important thing about a general science training is that science teaches you to think for yourself and to reflect on things and to analyze um, on things. And that's an important training. And I'm just giving the example of um, E numbers, okay? So, sorry, what was your name? Chloe. Chloe gave, I think, a very good description of E numbers. Um, probably more accurate than, than what you would normally get from your, your age group. So in going through the e numbers, they, it's exactly as you said, they are made in a lab, they are synthetic, they're artificial. And in terms of the colors, they go yellow, orange, red, and they come with an e number. And the idea of the e number was, the, originally was to assure the consumer that they were safe. So the European Commission introduced them to tell you that they were uh, safe, and that lots of safety checks have been done. And any time you put a, one of these colors into a food product, you declare it, and the amount you put in is covered by regulation. And in general, the food industry is very, very tightly controlled by regulation. 
And why do they think we needed the e-numbers? Because a lot of the chemical names were just too long to put them onto to products. So it was a, what they thought was an easy way of putting the e-number onto the product and it would be regulated. But as you rightly have identified, most things associated with e-numbers from a press point of view is bad press. Okay, so you'll see headlines like there, e-numbers can do psychological harm to children, cancer scare over food colours added to sausage. And then they have this published danger list from these e-numbers. And quite an important study associated with hyperactivity or behavioural issues within children was the Southampton report. And it's just to demonstrate to you that this report um, did show that there were hyperactivity issues associated with children who'd concern, who had consumed certain additives, including colour. But despite the fact that this study has been showed to be very, very flawed and that you can't draw that conclusion, what's gone into people's minds is that e-numbers are bad. And I think when you're a scientist and you're working in the area, what you have is the, you would have as the ability when you're a trained scientist is to look at that information for yourself and decide whether this is, is, is true or not. Because an awful lot of effort goes into make sure e-numbers are safe, but often this is the only message that you'll receive. Okay, so I think you probably are all doing uh, science for your junior cert, and even that is a good foundation. Yeah? That they originated from plants, is it? You're saying yeah. that? Yeah, an awful lot of, uh, particularly the stabilizers are quite natural products, things like carrageenans coming from uh, seaweed. Um, so yeah, they're, they're, they wouldn't, they were natural products to begin with. But the reason they're additives is that they may not be normally present in food products. So once you're putting something that wasn't naturally originally in a product into another one, then it's called an additive. Yeah, but, so lots of them do come from just natural plant sources. Okay, so hopefully, just this cartoon there where this uh, young girl is hoping to be protected from the additives and the preservatives, that with science training, that that's not the type of attitude that you'll take if it's something that you're just reading from the press, that you will know how to go and work out the knowledge for yourself and draw your own uh, conclusions, which is a very important bit of science training, whether it's chemistry or, or whether uh, it's physics.